Trump and the NFL battle over national anthem protests and why you should care or just the battle over the national anthem? My name is Paul Gordon, and I am with iState.tv, and this is a special in-depth news watch report on, well, the kerfuffle that is the battle, uh, the battle of tweets, the battle of words, the battle of protests between Donald J. Trump, the President of the United States of America, and... Uh, the entire NFL. <laughs> so President Donald Trump started a firestorm with commentary uh, that we're gonna we're gonna play some of that uh, later on. That he offered during a campaign speech in Huntsville, Alabama, that happened this Friday, this past Friday, September twenty second. Now during that speech, he suggested that NFL owners should fire the son of a bitch that refused to stand for the national anthem. He also suggested the first owner uh, that would do that would be the most popular person in the country, <laughs> with a caveat being at least for a week. So Roger Goodell responded to the president's comments uh, by saying, in part, the NFL and our players are our, at our best when we help create a sense of unity in our country and our culture. There is no better example than the amazing responses from our clubs and players to the terrible natural disasters we've experienced over the last month. Divisive comments like these demonstrate an unfortunate lack of respect for the NFL, our great game, and all of our players and a failure to understand the overwhelming force for good our clubs and players represent in our communities. So Goodell issued his statement on Saturday morning, September 23rd. The next morning, September 24th, Donald Trump responded with two tweets on Sunday morning, September 24th, that seemed to at least encourage a boycott of the NFL and hinted that the NFL was already suffering due to its recent political stances. So the first tweet says, if NFL fans refuse to go to games until players stop disrespecting our flag and country, you will see changes take place fast, fire, or suspend. And the second tweet that followed right after that, a continuation, actually, one was at 6.44 a.m., then I guess he thought about it, and then this one's 7.13 a.m., NFL attendance and ratings are way down, boring games, yes, but many stay away because they love our country, league should back the U.S. So the NFL, well, they responded, they responded bigly. Some team owners made statements that matched what Jeffrey Lurie of the Philadelphia Eagles said. Lurie said, in part, having spoken with our players, I can attest to the great respect they have for the national anthem and all it represents. We at the Philadelphia Eagles firmly believe that in this difficult time of division and conflict, it is more important than ever for football to be a great unifier. So the Eagles and other teams stood for the national anthem, but locked arms while they did so. Other teams... Other teams knelt as one, such as the Jackson Jaguars and the Baltimore Ravens, and they did so on foreign soil. So that was that was not well received, as you can imagine. The game between the two teams was played, you see, in the UK. So one team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, made an announcement that the players would not come out for the national anthem, but one player did come out, and that was Alejandro Villanueva. So photos show that many of the other players for the team actually stood at the end of the tunnel for na the national anthem, but they did not come out of the tunnel like Villa Nuevo did. So all told, about uh, 150 or so players uh, took part in the anthem protest uh, in this past weekend's slate of games, 
And Roger Goodell responded to the protest with this comment, the way we reacted today and this weekend made me proud. I'm proud of our league. Now, the NFL did not have their players come out during the national anthem at all until 2009 when they began to be paid by the federal government to do so. The NFL and its teams have been paid, uh, well, various numbers, but, but at least over $50 million by the Department of Defense since 2009 to not only send its players out to stand for the national anthem, but also put on other displays of patriotism and support for the military. So the NFL is still taking payment by the Department of Defense to put on these patriotic displays. And it's also currently relying on taxpayer subsidies to fund its stadiums to the tune of sixty-seven or six point seven billion that's with a B six point seven billion dollars in the last twenty years, with many more hundreds of millions of dollars expected in the near future with the new stadium in Las Vegas alone for the to be Las Vegas Raiders. So for his part, President Donald Trump may have broken the law with his tweets suggesting that the NFL should be boycotted. Uh, And this is uh, 18 U.S. Code, paragraph 220C, wrongfully influencing a private entity's employment decisions by a member of Congress or an officer or employee of the legislative or executive branch. The whole the whole code there is is posted on the on on the article that uh, I wrote that this video is based on, and the link to the article, of course, is both in the description as well as the comments below. And I'll let you go there rather than reading the whole code here. So, of course, the fact that Trump Trump did not directly call for a boycott leaves him plenty of of wiggle room to avoid prosecution. Again, you look at that tweet, and it says if. If, if they refuse to go to games, uh, so that's uh, uh, of course he can he can easily say, "Dude, I'm just uh, I'm just saying." If now the second tweet, however, where he is, um, yeah, again, he is not directly calling for a boycott, but he's suggesting. That maybe it's already happening. So whatever the case might be, the political opponents, of course, will use that law. And uh, as I always say, there is no rule of law. There's no rule of power. So it remains to be seen any law that is written, especially in the way even that law is written. You could choose to enforce that law and say, nope, he did it. Or you could choose not to enforce the law and say, no, 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 no. It's a loophole. So I guess it, it, it completely depends on your perspective, mainly. Is Donald Trump your guy? Does he represent your team? Or does he represent your enemy's team? So uh, on the on the article, I also have a link to a video that I created. It's just a, a brief little synopsis of everything that's happened. And you can go there and, and, and check that out. Most of the people that read my articles and or watch my videos I'll say regularly, of course, I get some video traffic and uh, article traffic from folks that find me for one reason or another because I showed up in a search engine or whatever the case might be. But the folks who are regularly looking at my stuff, they mostly fall within the range of limited government to full on anarchist. There's a you know limited government, anarchist, anarchist. So this audience largely looks at all of the machinations of the debate over kneeling for national anthems or standing as the wrong conversation to have in the first place. From the perspective of many people within this range, people such as myself, for, for, for example, the fact that a national sports business is mixing so many what I'm going to describe as, well, obedience encouraging rituals to the state into their games. Well, from our perspective, it kind of borders on the creepy. So this looks, to people like me, this looks similar to the creepiest group think chanting 
and other types of rituals we see coming out of North Korea or any other totalitarian regime for that matter. So to be sure, I am not suggesting that America is North Korea, only that the ritual, which is how people like me view it, has the same appearance as the rituals we see coming out of North Korea. Now, sure, to be sure, they're not paying tribute to an individual like they do in North Korea, but to a quote-unquote state. But still, for people like me, the fact that it's not an individual, but a state getting this, what, what seems like socially demanding level of submission in the form of standing and putting your hand over your heart during the playing of the state's theme song, it really doesn't make this whole thing any less creepy to us. I mean, you know, no offense to you that uh, uh, value the, uh, the national anthem. I don't mean to demean you or anything. I'm just telling you from our perspective, there's no way around it. It looks creepy to us. So for people like me and probably uh, many of you reading this article or watching this video, what to do during the playing of the national anthem is actually a debate that we often have among ourselves. Seriously, this is something that we have to consider. When we're going to an event where we know that the national anthem is going to be played, we have to consider this. So uh, standing for the national anthem and putting our, our hands over our hearts pretty much violates our core beliefs. So people like me... Uh, we don't believe in participating in rituals that seem to elevate central authorities to the way that I would look at it near demigod status, which is what this ritual seems to do. At least, again, from the perspective of people like me. So some of us choose to strategically make ourselves absent at events while the national anthem is being played. You know, it's the, oh, well, I'll just make sure I'm going to the bathroom while the national anthem is being played, and I'll avoid that all together. So I, for in one, I, I choose to stand. That's my choice. I stand, but I won't place my hand over my heart. I just, I just stand. And that usually, that's enough to not get any attention. Some choose to simply sit and face the social wrath that often happens when some individuals in a crowd decide to do something fundamentally different from the rest of the crowd. So for people like me, the national anthem protest, it's a non-issue. Uh, the conversation that, that we want to have is about the ritual itself. For people that do not view the world quite like I and others like me do, I completely understand why this issue is such a dominant topic around the proverbial, metaphorical, and sometimes literal water quarter, cooler. Now, what I would like you to understand, if you're one of those who believes in standing for the national anthem, is that people like me... I, I don't hate you. I'm not trying to personally hurt you by not standing for the national anthem. People like me, we, we simply have different worldviews on how humans should uh, govern themselves. That's it. So in this commentary, though, in this particular commentary, I do not wish to speak so directly to the people who do not share my similar worldview. I, I mean, I hope you're still watching because I think, if nothing else, you're going to learn a little bit about well, how people like me think, and maybe we can come to some greater understanding of one another. I doubt very much that I could come to an agreement with either side of the national anthem debate, the one that exists within the framework of national anthems being sung before sporting events, uh, being a, a perfectly respectable, perfectly reasonable display of patriotism and honor for all that our country has done for us and to honor and respect all those who died to make us free. Now, of course, there is so much that I disagree with in those sen sentiments. But for the purpose of this commentary, I'm, I'm not going to address them because I wish to speak to the people like me who already reject the idea of the national anthem in the first place. I'm here to say that for you, that for me, this debate currently going on around us is one worth noting, worth paying attention to. So I have explained in many previous articles and videos that I am a self-described viz provesian. It's a word that I coined. 
is means power, previous means individual. And to me, the word means, well, it stands for someone like me that believes in always working to tilt the balance of power away from coercive enterprises and towards individuals and free associations. You don't have to be an anarchist, a minarchist. You don't even have to be a limited government guy to believe that. All you have to believe is, listen, wherever, okay, yeah, where, wherever possible, wherever I see an opportunity, I'm going to tilt the balance of power towards individuals and free associations, and I'm going to follow that wherever that leads. So, so that is the perspective that I'm looking at things here. In order to more effectively be equipped to do this work, it is in my best interest to understand the reality of power around me. And it is to this end that I believe people like me have a reason to pay attention to this debate. For the nature of the debate, the reactions of the different interests involved in this debate can tell us a lot about the reality of power across all of what I would describe as the four uh, major spheres of power influence. And those major spheres are social influence, force influence, demonstrable, also market influence, and really market influence is, is nested within demonstrable influence, as well as finally ideational influence. So in this commentary, I'm going to narrowly focus on one aspect of this debate, and that is the president comments on Friday evening, the ones that triggered this reaction from the NFL. Uh, while many are pointing out, and correctly so, that the president's comments have actually expanded the anthem protest and galvanized the anthem protesters like they were not before, I think that some of them seem to be missing the other side of that galvanizing coin, which is what I, what I want to talk about today. So President Donald Trump launched into his criticism of the NFL anthem protest with this opening salvo, a salvo that includes an expletive, albeit a mild expletive by the, by the, by the standards of expletives. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! So if you look at the words here, he uses a very positive word to frame his alliance around. And that word is, is love. He immediately intones the high moral ground with this invocation of the word love to describe what will be a description of an action to fire the players that take part in the anthem protests. But on the other side, how does he describe the person who sits for the anthem? Well, first he uses the word disrespect. This word, disrespect, coupled with the word flag, invokes feelings of rage in his target audience, which I'm going to call the America First Nationalists, the deplorables, whatever you want to call them. First, he gives them the moral high ground using the word love. And then he gives them the fire, but he's... But he's not done with that fire. He goes on. So now that he has prepared his audience, giving them the moral authority to be outraged and further tweaking that sense of outrage, he's going to give them a reason to emotionally attach that sense of moral authority and outrage directly on to him as the leader of the fight against this outrage, this disrespect. And it's the very thing that, that so many people are focused on, and they don't understand why that was so strategically important to what he's doing. Because he does something that presidents in the 20th and 21st centuries have not typically done, at least not out in the open. He enters into the overt guttural if you will. He dares use the phrase son of a bitch to describe these men who dare take a knee during the national anthem. So this phrase does two things. First, it reinforces the outrage. It galvanizes his crowd to prepare to take action. 
and it also causes them to transfer their hopes and fears onto the bold leader, the man willing to continue to shatter the veneer of fake political politeness. And finally, stand up unapologetically against anyone who would dare challenge the sanctity of the source of their affection, the American state. So what Donald Trump is doing here is making himself, and I'm, I'm saying this metaphorically, he's making himself metaphorically priest and king in this exchange, though, though I'm, not, I'm not saying literally. So now that he has them, he's ready to pull the trigger on the action item, albeit at this point he's only opening the door to the ultimate action that is preparing, or that he is preparing to call him to take. What is it that you would love to hear? Well, you would love to hear that the person who knelt before you, or excuse me, who knelt uh, for the flag, who knelt for the uh, uh, the national anthem, was fired. First he says it plainly, then he says it viscerally, as if he were the only one making the command. He's fired! He's fired! He's fired! So I'm willing to bet at a subconscious level that his audience will make that connection. In their subconscious, this man of action, even though nothing will happen to these players because of his words, symbolically, emotionally, viscerally, Donald Trump fired these men who would dare disrespect the national anthem, who would dare solely the American state. And then, then he lets the stew brew. He allows the flames to bring the stew to boil. And when the stew is hot enough, when the steam rises from its boiling broth, we hear that steam resound. Very familiar chant. Now that he's galvanized the crowd, established their allegiance to him, and prepared them for the action to come, he's going to offer a token gesture of peace to the owners, one that I would wager he is almost sure will be rejected. You know, some owner's going to do that. He's going to say, that guy that disrespects our flag, he's fired. And that owner... They don't know it. They don't know it. They're friends of mine, many of them. They don't know it. They'll be the most popular person for a week. They'll be the most popular person in this country. Because that's... So Donald Trump is using social influence to appeal to the owners to take the action that he once taken. To fire the people who disrespect the flag. Reinforcing a powerful social pressure that already exists in this country, as well as any other countries for that matter. And that is this. If you do not love this country, if you do not respect its flag, its song, its history, then you are not worthy of even doing business with the people in this country that do love its flag, its song, its history. He's not only using social influence at a large-scale level, appealing to the attractive proposition of being very popular, but he's also appealing to the very personal level of social influence, friendship. As I said, I strongly suspect the president does not expect any owner to accept this. But if some do, if some decide to take him up on his offer, that he still gets the accomplished end to further solidify the social pressure on anyone who dares stand against the state flag, the state song, and so much more, which we'll get to very shortly. <laughs> I, 
I mean, <laughs> it's a win-win for Donald. If he doesn't get any of these owners to go along with his proposition to fire them and, and be liked by Donald and the whole nation, what he's done is simply established with his base, his magnanimity, his kindness, his benevolence, his mercy. He's establishing himself with his audience as the metaphorical God King. Or excuse me, the metaphorical good king, not God king, sorry. Just good king, not God king. The merciful priest. Listen, folks, no matter what you've done so far, you can make it right very quickly by simply doing this thing, helping we, the American people, nip this crazy anthem protest in the bud right here and right now. And now that he's offered the carrot to the owners, he follows it up with the stick. Because that's a total disrespect. Total. Total disrespect. Because that's a total disrespect of our heritage. That's a total disrespect of everything that we stand for. Okay? Everything that we stand for. So. Whose heritage is he describing here? He's describing the heritage of the American patriot, the one who honors the flag, the one who stands for the song. He's putting the NFL owners on the other side of that line. He's essentially making the owners and the players who participate in the anthem protests enemies of America. So if you don't fire these players, or if you as a player don't stand for that pledge, that that uh, anthem you are operating in direct opposition to the heritage of the american patriot and you are coming up against not just one aspect of who we are but you are coming up against everything that we are everything that we stand for so the message to the owners is simple conform and be loved or become an enemy of the american way so for some of you reading this or watching this video you probably are finding yourself in complete agreement with the president so i understand from your perspective why you believe this has as he does america is an integral part of your identity and i am not at least in this commentary i'm not declaring that what the president is doing here is right or wrong, but rather, I'm only describing, especially to the people like me, what I perceive to be as the reality of power reflected in what he is saying in this brief moment of what's essentially a, a campaign speech. So I want to also add that uh, uh, to those that are reacting with shock, shock, at President Trump's comments and who exists within the same parameters of human governance that President Trump exists in, uh, mainly within the model of the course of enterprise, the state, specifically the nation state, that this president's actions are the natural fruit of the very model that you continue to advocate. So today, today, it's your opponent using his platform to put pressure on your allies and tomorrow it will be your champion using their platform to put pressure on your enemies. So President Trump, I believe, understands this. So now, President Trump understands the reality of power. He understands that using force, influence, invoking laws or violations of laws, or even attempting to criminalize an action that is not already criminalized, it's not really on the table for him. With that understanding of the reality of power, he gives an acknowledgement to that limitation uh, when he says, and I know we have freedoms and we have freedoms of choice and many, many freedoms, but you know what? It's still totally disrespectful. So, he starts off acknowledging the limit in reality, but then he proceeds to reinforce the notion that to do this thing, to, to either uh, 
allow your players, if you're an owner, to kneel for the national anthem or to take the knee during the national anthem if you're a player makes you an enemy of the American patriot, the American way. To, to, to put it another way, because I know that can sound alarming, he, he's simply defining who's on the team and who's not on the team. He's reinforcing his call to action to his base, and he's helping the base identify each other more easily. And that's the, the American first crowd, the deplorables, whatever you want to call this, this coalition of folks that are rallying around Trump. The ones who voted for him, the ones who continue to support him. He is preparing them for two courses of action. To first, exert social influence, and second, to exert demonstrable specifically market influence on those who would dare stand against the flag, against the song of the state, the national anthem. President Donald J. Trump is not targeting you or I in this calculated move. He's actually targeting those that are intentionally using the tactic of invalidating your enemy's idol to replace it with another idol that, in the end, will demand just as much conformity as the one they're attempting to destroy. Still, even if we're not the target, that will matter little. That, that will matter little. For we are, well, we're accepted collateral damage by both sides. So to a large extent, what's going on here is Donald J. Trump has embraced the tried and true tactics of the, of the American left. During the campaign he followed, for the most part... Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals, and he's doing it now as well. And in this brief address to the NFL owners and players, he's actually following a few of Alinsky's tried-and-true rules. So the first rule is power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. And that power comes from two main sources, according to Alinsky. It comes from money and from people. So Donald Trump is claiming a power that he may or may not have, but he would be hoping the enemy perceives he has that power, the power to exert social influence on those who would undermine America. He could rally, well, not just social influence, but market influence. He can rally his army of deplorables to financially hurt his enemy, the NFL. So the second rule that he's using here is rule number two, never go outside the expertise of your people. It results in confusion, fear, and retreat. So the president stayed well within the bounds of his target audience. They understand supporting the national anthem. They understand how to apply social and market pressure on those who do not support the national anthem. And rule number three, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. There is no defense. It's irrational. It's infuriating. It also works as a key pressure point to force the enemy into concessions. So he certainly did that here. He's accusing the owners and players of fundamentally coming up against everything that the Americans, that is the Patriots, stand for. And the ne next rule that he's using here is, a good tactic is one your people enjoy. And <laughs> if you hear the reactions of the crowd, it's fair to say the president is employing a tactic his audience enjoys executing. And finally, the last rule that he's using here is this. If you push a negative hard enough, it will push through and become a positive. So violence from the other side can win the public to your side because the public sympathizes with the other do underdog. And that's, that's kind of what's, what's, what's going on here. While many are saying that the president's words have only served to galvanize the protesters and expand the protests, what he's actually doing, I believe, is nudging them towards making more extreme stances against the flag, against the national anthem. And, and he's making it much easier for, for his base to vilify them to rally around him in response and to be galvanized to take action against them. They are making themselves the bad guys. And, and, and he kind of triggered them to step up, step it up. The negative 
that these people are disrespecting the American way is pushing through to become a positive, that it will galvanize his base to take what I surmise will be a series of actions, including actions in November of 2018 that have very real, real consequences, uh, including market and social actions. And there's the, the last of Alinsky's rules is rule number 13, which I'm going to go ahead and, and say he's doing that as well. And that is pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. And the key part there is, is personalize it. Cut off the support network and isolate the target from sympathy. Go after the people and not the institutions. People hurt faster than institutions. So the president, in this moment of his Alabama speech, chose to do, go directly at the source of power for the NFL, the entity that gives these players the mega platform that they have to make these political statements. Did he go after? Did he go after the NFL? Nope. Well, he did, but he went specifically after the 32 owners. Yeah. He did so relentlessly, unapologetically, frankly viscerally he gave the nfl owners only one out complete compliance an out i would support he knew perfectly well that they would not take so the other tactic that uh the president is i'm going to say well he, he's incorporating is is called neoliberalism so this is a practice that began roughly in the late 60s early 70s and in many ways, I would argue it's gaining even more momentum over the last few years. So it's a tactic that uses market pressure to affect social change, even forcing state action through market pressure. The NFL itself has been a practicer, practitioner of this tactic, threatening states that pass legislation that counters the progressive agenda with boycotts, as they did with Arizona over illegal immigration laws that were passed, and with North Carolina over their so-called bathroom laws targeting transgenders. So what the president is telegraphing is that while progressives may hold a lot of board seats that enable them to use their power on these boards to get these mega corporations to uh, apply market pressures to advance the progressive agenda, his army of deplorables have their own market power. And if the corporations want to use their power to socially engineer America, the deplorables can use their buying power to counter that effort. Targeting one of the most powerful entities, the NFL, even if just symbolically, if not literally, of the neoliberal practice, is Trump's way of going directly after the source of the power of that practice. And he's doing it using their own tactics against them. From the perspective of the minarchist, the anarchist, the libertarian, the liberty government person, there are no good guys here. The two major antagonists in this fight, the America First crowd, Donald Trump's deplorables, and the social justice crowd, the progressives, both want a powerful central authority, both want to continue to use social influence, demonstrable or market influence, ideational influence, and force influence to assure that their ideas of human governance become the law of the land, the only socially, socially accepted practice of the land. So from the outside looking in, Donald Trump might appear as a wannabe tyrant, but I'm here to say that he is not. He is simply a reflection of the reality of power in the battle for human governance in America today. What Donald Trump most likely recognizes is that, is that there is no consolation prize for second place in the war for control of human governance in the land occupied by the American state. And as surely as he recognizes this fact, so too does the other side, the progressives. They've recognized this fact long before anyone who represented a coherent alternative to the progressives have done. The conservatives, for the most part, still do not realize that this battle for control of human governance in America is a winner-take-all contest, with only the winners standing at the end. Folks, there will be no compromise. There will be no bridging of differences. We have entered the Highlander part of American history. There can be only one. 
So it is within this context that I say, why the hell would it surprise any of you that the president has dramatically ratcheted up the vitriol against his political opponents? Barack Obama ratcheted, ratcheted up the vitriol compared to Bush the second, who ratcheted up the vitriol compared to Clinton, etc. The process of consolidation of power, the process of defining the emerging major factions who could potentially claim that position have been long. And it has been rapidly accelerating. But still, after all this, why should you? Why should people like me? Why should you care about this battle? You who are looking from the outside of a struggle that from your perspective is asking the wrong question. After all, both major factions at play here are starting with an assumption that a small number of individuals should have the power to dictate to everyone else, the rules of human governance, wielding the power to influence through social, demonstrable, or market, and even force influence, especially force influence. So this recent move by Donald Trump represents a dramatic escalation in the fight for hegemony over the American landscape. The president has essentially gone after one of the key symbols of the progressive tactic of neoliberalism. But on the other side, one that also happens to be one of the key symbols of the American way. Uh, the, 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 the NFL, and the NFL has embraced that image, most assuredly. Look at its symbol. It hasn't changed. It's a uh, extremely pro-Americana symbol there. So during these times, if you go against the progressive agenda in a major way, you can expect real market pressures coming to bear on you, as we've witnessed through social media targeting so-called hate speech, even domain registrars targeting the free speech platform Gab. But if you go against the America First agenda in a major way, you can expect real market pressure coming at you as we have witnessed with the people who've, who've, who've burned the American flag. Doesn't end well for you there, buddy. People's lives are, are literally being destroyed economically and socially for their beliefs, for their statements alone. The actions by this president are only going to increase the frequency of these incidents. What he has announced here is that his team the deplorables, the America Firsters, whatever you want to call this, this uh, coalition. They mean to fight the same total war that the progressives have been fighting for decades. And those of us that are caught in the middle would do well to ask ourselves before we sound off against a sacred cow of the progressives or a sacred cow of the deplorables, if that's a hill worth dying on. If it's not, then a little tactical restraint may be in order, lest you have already mentally given up everything that could be lost by engaging in a field of battle that, above all else, has no place for people like you, for people like me. But there's something else here that's worth noting for people like me. There's opportunity. There is hope. The tactic of progressives targeting the sacredness of the national anthem gives us an opportunity to join in that conversation. But it is a conversation we must enjoy with extreme diplomacy for the most part. The national anthem right now is being questioned by a group of people that want to destroy one idol to replace it with their own. So we can have a conversation about destroying idols and stop with no replacement in mind. We can do so most effectively, not by attacking those who respect the national anthem, but by asking them why. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even challenging them respecting the national anthem. What I want to ask, why? Why is it so important to you that others think and act like you? Why can you not let others live as they desire? When progressives kneel for the flag, though, 
They're not telling the other side that they simply reject the whole idea of state songs being ritualized at sporting events. I guarantee you, you know, you you can easily see, okay, it's the national anthem today and it's the American flag today. Guess what it could be tomorrow? You know, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and follow the cliche. I'm not necessarily think that this will happen, but I'll just follow the cliche here. Tomorrow it could be the hammer and sickle and you could be singing the international worker song. That's, it, it, you know, they're not talking about ending a national song. They're talking about replacing it. And they're telling the other side that they mean to attack everything that stands for, song stands for. And they're, they're, they're saying that whether they intend it that way or not. Because, again, they're not following up the protest gesture with a dialogue about questioning the very notion of singing state songs at sporting events. They're following it up with demands demands that only the state using its monopoly of force can carry out to be sure some of you know friends very well that might actually hear the message of liberty more easily if they are jarred out of their mindset with shocking maybe even uh maybe even offensive statements so i don't i, I don't i try to avoid absolutes and i'll i'll, I'll avoid that here but I strongly believe that the vast majority of people, especially when you're speaking to multiple people at once, directly or indirectly, will be far more receptive to hearing a challenge to their presuppositions that begin with understanding why the national anthem means so much to them and then using their own statements to challenge their tendency to lash out at anyone, I mean anyone, who dares not view the national anthem in the, 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 the same way that they do. The national anthem represents the flag that stood against tyranny, the flag that stood against the barrage in a fort outside of Baltimore during the War of 1812. The national anthem pays tribute to the men and women who died so that we all might be free. These are... Some of the typical responses I get when I ask that question. And for now, I'm not interested in challenging those assumptions so much as I am in just challenging one assumption. Just one. And if, and if you're in that camp, this is the only assumption that I want to challenge you on. And that is this. An assumption that, if successfully challenged, will open the door for other assumptions to be challenged. And the assumption is this. If the national anthem stands for freedom, if it honors the men and women who died to keep us free, then why are you coming so hard against people for exercising that freedom, especially for people like, well, people like me, who have no desire to destroy one idol to replace it with another? As a matter of fact, I don't necessarily have a desire to destroy your idol I, I have a desire to, to work out alternatives and uh, see what emerges. That's it. In summation, the battle between President Donald Trump and his deplorables, or whatever you want to call it, on one side, and the progressives, the neoliberals, the NFL, and the players who chose to kneel, it represents two realities of power one of which should serve as a caution for those who, for whatever reason, are not ready to pay a potentially high price for activism, and one which should serve as an opportunity to open doors for others to find their way outside of the paradigm altogether to find their way to what I will call authentic liberty. I believe that we're at a critical time in history, human uh, in the history of human governance, not just in America, but in the world, one which I believe has not been seen since the closing of World War I, where people are coming face to face in direct ways with the cost of perpetuating the current model of human governance, the heavy handed model of the coercive enterprise, the state, more specifically, the nation state. The extremes. Uh, the extremes on all sides will only continue to increase. The cost for dissent from these worldviews will only increase. And the latest battle reflects that reality perfectly. 
But, and this is the most important part for those who are close to my worldview, there is an opportunity, as there was in World War I, where whole brigades near the end, for instance, simply walked away, fed up with the cost of being part of the nation state. Opportunity to present another alternative, one that need not cost so much, one that would allow for much more natural diversity than could ever occur with ossifying coercive enterprises where power tends to gather more and more toward the center, attracting more and more narcissistic people to take advantage of the benefits of being the ones to wield that level of power. So there are a lot of different, difficult, challenging questions to be asked about how humans govern and how we organize ourselves. And we can't ask them all at once. But we have an opportunity here to ask a simple question. Why? Why do you demand conformity while you claim to represent freedom, liberty? If they can come to realize that they cannot hold to both the moral high ground of freedom and the demands of compliance to their state-inspired rituals, then we will have opportunities to ask more profound questions that could help create greater opportunities for the spontaneous emergence of liberty. So I am Paul Gordon with iState.tv, and this has been a special investigatory or in-depth uh, report on the, the Trump NFL national anthem debate. If you like what you see, want you to make sure that you go to our channel, which is iState, youtube.com backslash iState. Make sure that you subscribe and hit that bell. And please be sure to share this video and share the channel with others so they can join in the, the fun and the excitement that is iState.tv. Until then, we'll see you when we, well, when we do our next video, whenever that is.